and welcome to RPTV Weekly News Show. My name is Murphy Brown, and my co-hosts are Fred Alvarado and Javen Ha. We present news that impacts Regent Park and other surrounding communities located in the downtown east neighborhoods of Toronto. In this episode, we present you the following news for the week of October 26 to November 1st. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has recently announced that 130 countries, including Canada, have backed a plan to establish a global minimum corporate tax rate, which will aim to reduce the use of tax havens around the world. The new global pact will seek to deter companies from relocating profits to jurisdictions where they will pay little to no tax, often in places where the company has little to no business presence. Additionally, it will curb the use of tax havens, a practice that has been widely criticized by regulators around the world. The agreement sets in motion a historic opportunity for governments to collect a greater share of the wealth generated by the world's richest companies. Finance Minister Christian Freeland said in a statement that Ottawa strongly supports international efforts to end the corporate race to the bottom and that Canada will work with its international partners to implement the deal. Canada's priority and our preference has always been a multilateral agreement. We have a clear and compelling national interest in this multilateral deal, which protects against erosion of our tax base and which will generate significant additional revenue for Canada and ensuring that all corporations including the world's largest, pay their fair share. You come here like every other new Canadian has come here, you work your tail off. If you think you're coming to collect the dole and sit around, not going to happen. Go somewhere else. You want to work? Ontario Premier Doug Ford is declining to apologize for comments he made about immigrants. After an unrelated announcement on Monday, October 18th in Tecumseh, Ontario, Ford launched into a familiar line about Ontario's biggest problem being a shortage of workers, particularly in trades and construction. He said people who want to come and work their tail off, like every other new Canadian, has done should come to Ontario. But people who want to, quote, collect the dole and sit around, end of quote, should go somewhere else. The term collect the dole, which means accessing social assistance, is a disparaging term used to describe the act of accessing government programs that provide a minimum level of in income support to individuals and households living in poverty. The Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, OCASI, says Ford should not be promoting xenophobic tropes about immigrants. NDP leader Andrea Harwa had said in a tweet that Ford should apologize should apologize. What he was demonstrating is that uh, his opinions of, uh, of immigrants and newcomers uh, are, are racist, frankly. They are stereotypes that, uh, that are not true. Uh, they, feed, um, they feed divisiveness, uh, and, uh, and they can't be, they can't be accepted. A, a premier of this province that speaks with such ignorance uh, about uh, who it is that, um, 
you know, that uh, has built our entire province. We're a, we're a, a province and a country uh, of immigrants, and, and not just the ones that Mr. Ford would like to pick and choose. All, all of us have come, uh, except for First Nations people, the first peoples of this land, uh, from somewhere around this great world. And Ontario should be a place that welcomes everyone. Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca also called on the Premier to apologize, saying the comments were callous. He should reconsider. He should do the right thing. I urge him to apologize. It doesn't show weakness to apologize when you make a mistake. I think it actually shows strength. And I think what he said was, was incredibly hurtful to lots of Ontarians. Uh, the most important thing is that the language the leader of this province chose to use yesterday was divisive, it was hurtful. Councillor Kristen Wong Tam wrote in an email to RPTV News saying, these disappointing comments from the Premier are xenophobic, divisive, and misinformed. The majority of permanent newcomers to Canada are economic class, skilled workers, and skilled trades. These skills and the financial assets required to enter Canada and sponsor a family would place any newcomers well above the asset limits required for Ontario Works. The Premier's comments are demeaning and inexcusable. Once again, he demonstrates why he is not fit to lead the most diverse province in Canada. Doug Ford's comments are particularly offensive to communities like Regent Park, Moss Park, and St. Jamestown, which are home to large populations of low-income, hard-working immigrants. The Ford government reduces barriers for immigrants with foreign credentials. The recent announcement on October 21st, 2021 by the Ford government to remove the work certification for immigrants comes as much welcomed move for many newcomers and also various Ontario job sectors that have seen an increased demand for skilled workers. Currently, there is a labor shortage in Ontario with 300,000 jobs unfilled. The consequences for the government mean billions of dollars in lost productivity. Ontario would become the first province in Canada to level the playing field for skilled profession professionals. How? By eliminating unfair requirements to have Canadian work experience unless required for public health and safety by reducing and streamlining language tests, and by ensuring license applications are processed faster. Make no mistake, these changes will have a huge impact on newcomers and contribute to their success and ours. These changes aren't contentious, they're just long overdue. Today's announcement builds on the work we are already doing to help skilled immigrants find work in their field of expertise through the Ontario Bridge Training Program. Over the next three years, we are investing $67 million in 46 projects that will help internationally trained immigrants get licensed so they can start working. Connecting a newcomer with the job he or she is qualified to do means more than just a paycheck. It returns to them a sense of meaning, dignity, and purpose. The final choice of sectors affected by the legislation has not yet been determined, and it may take up to 24 months to implement the changes. But these are some of the sectors that are currently known to be on the list. Association of Professional Engineers of Ontario, Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario, College of Early Childhood Educators, Ontario Association of Architects, Ontario Association of Certified Engineering Technicians and Technologists, Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers, Ontario College of Teachers. Canada, as we know, it is a land of immigrants, from the first European settlers who arrived here at the beginning of the 17th century to the most recent influx of immigrants from Afghanistan. 
Newcomers have been the lifeblood of Canada's development. The news that Ontario government might relax the accreditation regulations is indeed a welcome turn of events for immigrants in the Regent Park, Moss Park, and St. Jamestown area who are looking to kickstart and return to their original career paths. We want uh, immigrants and new Canadians to reach their full uh, potential here. I think and I, I talk often about the shortage uh, in the skilled trades. I mean, we need uh, 100,000 uh, workers uh, in Ontario in the trades uh, over the next uh, number of years. These are jobs that pay six figures with a defined pension and benefit. Uh, again, this is about unlocking the full potential of uh, immigrants and, uh, you know, supporting them and, and their families with, with bigger paychecks and better working conditions. Uh, and uh, it will uh, go a long ways to dealing with the labour shortage that we have. And now we have a story with Javin Hawk on Uber drivers and gig economy workers pressuring Ontario government for employee status. Uber drivers and gig economy workers pressure Ontario government for employee status. People in Ontario who drive or deliver for apps such as Uber, Lyft and Skip, the dishes are calling on Premier Doug Ford's government to grant them basic workers' rights by classifying them as employees. Since app-based workers are currently classified as independent contractors under Ontario's Employment Standards Act, they are not entitled to minimum wage, vacation days or statutory holiday pays. The companies they work for do not have to pay employment insurance premiums or Canada's pension plan contributions. While Ontario's Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development, Monte McNaughton, is promising legislation to protect and support vulnerable workers by the end of the month, he is not promising to classify app workers as employees. The question of whether app-based workers should be classed as employees is at issue in a 400 million class action lawsuit against Uber Canada on behalf of its Ontario drivers. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers, CUPW, has led attempts of unionization app-based workers. The delivery company, Foodora, ceased its operation in Canada in the spring of 2020 in the wake of one such unionization drive. Failing to classify gig workers as employees is creating two classes of workers right now within our society, and we do not want that, said CUPW President Jan Simpson. If Ford government truly wanted to support workers in just economic recovery, they must get rid of the misclassification, Simpson said, in an interview. It's unclear how many people on Ontario work for the app-based companies, but it definitely numbers in the tens of thousands, and there's some evidence it could exceed to 100,000. In the downtown east area, Regent Park, Moss Park, and St. Jamestown constitute some of the most ethnically diverse communities, although sometimes the indigenous populations that also call these neighborhoods home are not as well talked about. In an effort to bring more attention to this community, we present the indigenous report. The Regent Park community would like to welcome the Thunder Woman Healing Lodge Society into the neighborhood. The organization is located at the corner of Dundas and Berkeley at 413 Dundas Street East. The Thunder Woman Healing Lodge Society grew out of a need to break the cycle of over-representation of indigenous women in Canada's prison system. The mandate of the organization is to provide a place where First Nation, that is status and non-status, Inuit and Métis, 
two S L G B T Q I A plus women can heal and reclaim their positive cultural identity and place for rehabilitation and wellness. According to its website, Thunder Woman Healing Lodge Society provides a holistic healing process based on indigenous traditional teachings and healing practices. Indigenous women who have been involved with the Canadian criminal justice system face multiple challenges while incarcerated and when they try to re-enter civil society. Reconnecting them with their cultural and spiritual identities is seen as a key component to reintegrating into society. Thunder Woman Healing Lodge Society has prioritized three areas of activity. Restoring, identity, providing housing, and creating opportunity. Each of these programs has identified the key concerns and pathways for Indigenous women who either are still in correction institution, those who are currently before the courts, and those who have been released. Thunder Woman Healing Lodge Society believes that reducing the number of Indigenous women in Canadian prisons is tied to creating the opportunities for them to thrive, providing stable employment, affordable housing, and access to adequate medical supports are crucial to the building of independent lives post-release. And we continue with a report of the October 24th SDP Stakeholders Planning Committee meeting. The October 24, 2021 SDP Planning Committee meeting was held over Zoom and each meeting began with a review of the purpose of the committee. The purpose of the planning committee. <laughs> the Thank planning you. committee makes recommendations to the SDP stakeholders table on strategic direction and action priorities, intercommittee alignment, coordination, stakeholder and resident engagement, supporting the SDP stakeholders table to ensure the meetings are effective, supporting the four work groups to prepare to report at the SDP stakeholder table meetings, address requirements and or requests that need a quick response, identifying information and or expertise that stakeholders require in order to make sound and informed decisions, and developing facilitation approaches that increase the capacity of all stakeholders to engage in discussion and decision making. After housekeeping items related to scheduling the next meetings of the stakeholders table, Lindsay Jackson, convener of the SDP planning group and City of Toronto staff, began the business of the meeting by reminding the group that according to the SDP terms of reference, agency and resident co-chairs terms were up and it was time for each of the SDP working groups to select new co-chairs. It was agreed that each group would develop their own process to select their co-chairs. Lindsay also reminded the group that residents will receive honorarium for their work as co-chairs, and therefore all selections of co-chairs should undergo a fair and transparency process. Diana Meivunduse added that clear descriptions about the task and responsibilities of co-chairs were also required. During the debate, it was revealed that not all the committees have terms of reference and those that do not need it updated. It was agreed that all the working group terms of references should be updated and standardized to abide by guidelines already established in the guiding documents of the SDP. There was also an agreement that the SDP subcommittees also needed to have terms of references. Petra, a social work student working with CSI, 
agreed to help update all the terms of references and develop roles and responsibilities. The next agenda item was related to finalizing the $50,000 operated budget. Each year, the City of Toronto provides $50,000 to pay for the operating costs of the SDP. One of the items proposed by the Communication Working Group for funding to the operating budget was interim funding for Regent Park Social. Adonis Huggins and Denise Sodean O'Leary, agency representatives of the Communications Working Group, explained that the Regent Park Social is a website developed by Ibrahim Afra, a community resident. The website pertains to all sorts of information about Regent Park. Although the SDP is already funding a community app as the main communication platform for the Regent Park community, this app is still in development and not expected to be released until early 2022. The Communications Working Group's proposal is to fund Regent Park Social for the period of 20 weeks related to the use of Regent Park Social as an interim communication platform for the SDP while the community app is still in development. It was noted that Ibrahim Afra has been updating SDP information on the website voluntarily since April 2021. The amount that the communication is requesting for the 20-week period is approximately $8,000. Adonis added that due to the delay of other operating budget items, funding for the Region Park Social website for the requested amount would not impact the operating budget. The problem in making this decision is that the city has stated informally and formally that they would not fund Regent Park Social. Although no reason was given for rejecting a proposal to fund Regent Park Social, it was surmised by Diana Mabunduse that it is because Regent Park Social is not considered a website governed fully by SDP. It is Ibrahim's website, and although he is a passionate member of the community and very involved in the SDP, he is not accountable to anyone for what he posts or not post. After some debate, it was agreed that the planning committee would support and endorse a proposal for interim funding of Regent Park Social and that the planning committee would follow up with a letter of support and a request to meet city decision makers about it. Danny Peter argues that the planning committee needs to have a conversation with the city, clarifying the role of the 50,000 operating budget as well as the community's jurisdiction over it. The meeting ended with an announcement by Ismael Afra that the funding subcommittee of the SDP in partnership with the Regent Park Community Health Center was successful in obtaining a federal anti-racism grant in the amount of $275,000 of federal funding. The funding committee will be working with the health center to hire staffing and roll out the activities. Report of Session 3 of the 2021 Second Annual SDP Deep Dive. The third session of the annual 2021 SDP Deep Dive took place over Zoom on the evening of Thursday, October 21st, 2021. Representatives of the SDP Stakeholders Table were present along with invited guests who were proposing projects for funding. The deep dive is a unique consens consensus decision-making model designed by the Regent Park SDP Planning Committee to determine how $500,000 of yearly city funding towards the Regent Park social development plan will be spent. Any resident organization or group residing in or serving Regent Park could submit a proposal to the deep dive for any activity 
so long as that activity is deemed to improve the lives of residents in Regent Park. Additionally, proposals should be aligned with one of the four priority areas of the SDP. Communications, community building, economic development and employment, and safety. The third session was hosted by Walid Kogali, who is co-chair of the Community Building Working Group. Walid had the assistance of Michael Rosenberg, another member of the Community Building Working Group, as well as Denise Sudian O'Leary from Center for Social Innovation from Center for Social Innovation and Agency Co-Chair of the Communications Group. After introductions, the business of the deep dive began with a presentation from Sam Wise. Sam missed the previous two sessions of the deep dive and as a result did not have an opportunity to present his two-minute proposal to the group. Unfortunately, the organizers failed to inform Sam that he only had two minutes and his presentation was given far more time than last week's presenters. Sam's proposal was for $100,000 in funding for the setting up of a community print shop. Several questions were addressed to Sam about his proposal. Unfortunately, there was a lot of confusion about Sam's request as his proposal was still not available for members to access and review despite a confirmation by the Community Building Working Group last meeting that his proposal was received on time. Sam was asked to place his proposal on the Google Drive with the others. Following Sam's presentation, all the deep dive attendees were asked to talk about their favorite projects, ones that they were not involved with. Following a short break, a chart was presented listing all the projects along with their budget requests. Taking account of projects that had withdrawn from the deep dive, Michael informed the group that the total request of all the submissions amounted to approximately $900,000, which is far beyond the $500,000 budget. The group was then given the task of looking to see what projects could be combined and possibly share costs, resulting in reductions of budgets. Several suggestions were made, but none of these suggestions identified saving costs. Partway through this discussion, the question of funding for profit groups arose. Oglets, again, a City of Toronto staff member, reminded the group that city funding would only be restricted to activities that were deemed not for profit. This meant that project submissions from groups that identified themselves as a social enterprise or for profit was in jeopardy of not being considered for funding. The elimination of these groups would represent a significant amount of reductions to the deep dive. Ogled suggested that these groups should be withdrawn until the next round to give the city time to assess the eligibility of the groups and their activities. This suggestion was strongly opposed by Michael Rosenberg. Instead, Michael proposed that a meeting with those groups in question be set up prior to the next DELF 
to assess their eligibility. It was also proposed that a separate funding arrangement may need to be set up for these groups. The deep dive session ended with no concrete budget reductions made. For the next meeting, the working groups and individuals were asked to review their proposals and suggest budget reductions. The last and final meeting of the deep dive will take place on Thursday, October 28, 2021 over Zoom. And now we continue with a weekly update of COVID-19 and vaccination. And starting this week, the province is lifting capacity limits in places where proof of vaccination is required, including food and drink establishments, indoor areas of sports and recreation facilities, gaming establishments and indoor meeting and event spaces, as well as some outdoor settings. City staff are reviewing the announcement for what impact it may have on city facilities and activities, including recreation and community centers. This next step of reopening would not be possible without the millions of Toronto residents who have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 83% of eligible Toronto residents have now been fully vaccinated. Last week, the province announced that Vaccinated individuals can download an enhanced vaccine certificate with a QR code that can be scanned. The province also released the Verify Ontario app, enabling businesses and organizations to scan the QR code found on people's enhanced vaccine certificates. For the love of series, in the first six episodes of the series produced by Focus Media, Arts in partnership with the Downtown East Vaccine Engagement Cluster. Mena, Alana, Manula, Riley, Yana, and Humaya explain, explain why they choose to get the COVID 19 vaccine. So I got vaccinated for the love of traveling and for being safe. And overall, I would say it was such a great experience and nothing went wrong with it. I had no symptoms no side effects, and I would recommend getting the vaccination to everyone. Yeah, I think the vaccine is good because it'll help us get back to normal life sooner. And I just, it's really sad when someone you know gets COVID. So I wouldn't want that to happen because I love my friends and family. The experience of getting vaccinated both times was really easy and simple. I think I got done within like 30 minutes. Overall, a very positive experience. Um, we were lucky to have had it because a lot of my friends in the Philippines can. So yeah, um, I did it because mainly because I love my family and I love going out. Now I'll be presenting events in Regent Park community. The Children's Book Bank is open for families to visit and pick up free books to keep at 350 Berkeley Street, location under, until December 4th. In January 2022, the Children's Book Bank is reopening at their new location at Daniel Spectrum, 585 Dunda Street East, in the heart of Regent Park. Saturday Storytelling Program at Allen Gardens Park in collaboration with the Children's Book Bank, Allen Gardens Park and Ryerson University Office of Social Innovation starting Saturday, October 30th. We will run this program every other Saturday for the next year. This Saturday we'll be celebrating Halloween. We'll have goodie bags and free books for all children and of course some awesome stories. Toronto Community Housing and Tridel is inviting you to join the Regent Park revitalization of Phase 4 and 5 team for a community drop-in to see how key themes and elements could be included in the design of Phase 4 and 5 and tell us what you think. This will take place on Saturday, October 30, 2021 
between 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. at 150 River Street, ground floor. Max will be mandatory. If you have any questions, email talkregionpark at torontohousing.ca. The planning of the future, so phases four and five, uh, which are the blocks along uh, Gerard between River and almost all the way down to Parliament. Uh, so we're having a, an open house, a community drop-in, this Saturday between 12 and 4 p.m. And we're where we are right now, 150 River, is the place to be. So you should come out. It's going to be great. It's going to be an opportunity for you to what? What's, what is well, it? to talk about themes and elements for the future, last phases of, Re of Regent Park, to have you engaged and uh, influence the design so we can make this a complete community. Yeah, it's, it's your future, it's your community, and, and we are committed to working very closely with you in developing the plan, but it need, means that you need to actually come out and talk to us. So please join us this Saturday. Uh, for this, uh, you know, one one of the important opportunities to talk about what where the buildings are going to be, what are the, the services, the facilities, open space. We've heard a lot from the community to date. We've had a number of sessions already. Uh, this is an important one, but we're going to be working. We're going to be working on this through, with the community through the rest of this year and all through 2022 on on finalizing finalizing this plan but please come out this Saturday and whether you're an individual or a community group you can um, use the email here if you have any questions it's talkregionparktorontohousing.ca and we will get back to you as soon as you get in touch with us downtown east resident grants up to six thousand is available for communities and residents groups working in the downtown east for a one-time project that supports community safety and well-beings. This initiative is sponsored by the City of Toronto in partnership with the neighborhood group TNG. Applications are due by November 15 at 12 p.m. There will be a chai and chat with Sherburn Health. This will take place on Saturday, October 30th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. LGBTQ2S folks are invited to join us at the Maitland and Church under the white tent to chat about the COVID-19 vaccine over tea and refreshments. I'm Jabin Hawk and that was all for the events in Regent Park Weekly News. And that's all for today's show. My name is Murphy Brown and my co-hosts are Fred Alvarado and Jabin Hawk from our studios at Focus Media Arts Center Thank you for watching and see you next week. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And when you do subscribe, hit the little notification bell so you never miss out on any of our content. If you'd also like more, you can find us on our other social media platforms. And if you want even more, you can look at our website.